Opioid addiction is a national public health crisis that affects individuals and families regardless of their age, race, or income. The statistics are overwhelming. More than 130 people die from opioid addiction every day. But there is hope. Recovery is possible. The information contained in these podcasts is solely for informational purposes and should not replace advice from a medical provider when making healthcare decisions. This podcast contains opinionated content and may not reflect the opinions of any organization this podcast is affiliated with. We will discuss opioid use and opioid treatment, which may be triggering for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Today on Someone You Know, we are speaking with Patrick and Marcy. Patrick, an Independence Blue Cross employee, is sharing his personal story of living a fruitful life in recovery. And Marcy, a PICO employee, discusses her journey of caring for a loved one in recovery. Together, Patrick and Marcy open up about destigmatizing addiction in the workplace. Both Patrick and Marcy were instrumental in creating employee resource groups at their respective employers and detail how the workplace can be vital in inspiring hope. I'm your host, Heather Major, and this is Someone You Know. Well, I want to thank you both for being here today. Um, we're going to talk about stigma in the workplace um, and, and dive a little deeper into what we, what we can do and what we're doing to break the stigma. But first, let's um, let's do introductions. Hi, my name is Marcy Cheeseman, and I am a senior business analyst with PICO here in Philadelphia. Patrick Flynn, I'm a government affairs specialist here at Independence Blue Cross. So both of you uh, come come to this table today with with your own unique experiences with addiction. And I thought we could maybe talk about that first very briefly, um, your stories, uh, your connection, and then maybe talk about a little bit more about what you're doing in your leadership and advocacy roles, uh, if you wouldn't mind. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I have been since October 8th, 2014. Um, my journey started a, a long time before that, and you know, when I was about 12, 13 years old and started, started using drugs and alcohol as a First, you know, to be social and have fun with my friends, and you know, that's what we did on the weekends, and and it became a lot more for me than that. I always faced pretty severe consequences, and they never stopped me. And so I, I think my it was it was all a progression from you know the alcohol, and marijuana, to you know using cocaine and in the college years, and then um, getting getting into Percocet, and I think for me that's where things really shifted. And this is on this essentially on the same trajectory as the time that my father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And interesting for me, I was, I was completely addicted to to Percocets and and opioids for, for a number of years. And I never once had a prescription ever. And it got to the point where I was using, you know, 10 to 15 to 20, depending upon how, how much money I could get 30 milligram Percocets every single day. And I never once had a prescription for any of them. And this, this went on for a long time, numerous attempts at treatment. Um, and I, I just never really care. I was talking to Marcy earlier about how there were times where I would, you know, think about how bad those withdrawals were from, from the drugs I was doing when I would go into detox or something would happen and I would have to detox and how I would come out of treatment. And there'd be a morning where I could sit down and take a lie detector test and they would ask me, will you ever use a drug ever again? And I would say no. And I would, pa- I know for a fact I would pass that lie detector test and later that night I would be using mm-hmm. again. And that's just how, how my mind worked. And, and finally, after a slew of my father passed away in 2011 and I, I really started going downhill. And then finally in o- October of 2014, something finally clicked. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but finally it just became too much. It was, uh, the consequences really started outweighing the benefits of what I was doing. And finally I decided to to try to make a change. Right? I wasn't fully invested yet. I wasn't sure if this would work, but I figured I have nothing else to lose. So why not, why not at least give it a try, give it an honest try. And if it doesn't work, I could always go back to what I was doing. And um, I had not used a drug or taken alcohol or anything since that day. Marcy, how about you? Well, my uh, journey with addiction, if you want to call it that, um, is not as an addict, but as a loved one of an addict. And I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. Um, Aunts, uncles were alcoholics. Um, My brother was a addict. Uh, 
and then you know all those things have an impact on you and um, then it got to the point where my son I knew he was smoking pot and um, he was drinking and he had a football injury uh, his senior year of high school and he was prescribed Percocets so he did have a prescription and you know the doctor kept increasing the milligrams and increasing the milligrams and you know then it was I, I don't have enough and mom can you give me fifty dollars or mom can you give me a hundred dollars and I, I'm in so much pain I'm in so much pain and, and I did that I, I was an enabler and um, we had a lot of different things that occurred in the family some serious life events I lost a brother uh, divorce after 28 years Chris decided that's my son he wanted to live with me and we moved from the house that he knew um, and I didn't realize how bad his addiction was and I did not know that he was a heroin addict at that time and um, I kept saying to him this can't go on you know I can't continue to do this and I went to work every day not knowing if he was going to be there when I got home. I went to work every day not knowing if I was going to find him dead when I got home. Um, and then it was the text messages, when will you be home? I need this, I need that, um, you know. And that's what went on. And it was finally, he kept saying, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to rehab, Mom, I promise. And um, it was Christmas of 2015. And I said to him, this is it, I can't do this anymore. I said, you have to make a decision and it has to be now or I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I can't help you anymore. And he said, okay, I'll go. And he was in the rehab facility the day after New Year's Eve. And he has been clean and sober for three years and five months, one time in rehab but it was um, a horrific journey of locking your bedroom door at night because you didn't want him to be able to get to his pills and take more than he should or take something to sell it. It was just something that I don't think anybody should have to go through, whether you're the addict or you're the loved one of an addict. And people don't understand truly what the life of an addict is or the life of the loved one of an addict and um, so for me when my son went through rehab there was a family program and I went through the family program and I decided I have to do something I wasn't quite sure what that something was but I decided I had to do something and that's how I or where I am today mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, I want to back up for a minute, though. So, Patrick, um, you've shared that, um, you know, family is a big part of your life. And at that time, you really didn't know, you know, how your behaviors and, and your addiction was really hurting or affecting your family. Um, but, you, but you became aware of that, and you were able to reconcile with, you know, a lot of things in your life that maybe you were missing out on before. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, sure. So I, I think in my active addiction, I was living in a constant state of self-centeredness, right? So I, at points, knew that my family was really struggling with what I was going through. But to be completely honest, I, I really didn't care because all I cared about is myself and the next drug. And I remember just the manipulation was, was endless from me. Um, as Marcy would talk about, I would call my mother at work 30 times in a row and when are you going to be home or can I stop down and get money from you? And, and my big thing was I would go to treatment, I'd get out and I would pretend that I was doing well. I'd say, but mom, I need, um, I need money. You don't understand. There's someone I owed money from, to from prior times and I really need to get that back to them. I would, I just, I remember crawling through my mom's room at night and because she would keep her purse right next to her bed and she would carry it everywhere with her and I would crawl next to her bed she would wake up I would just you know I would I would be kneeling next to her bed I'd say I just want to come in and tell you I love you and I would start giving her a hug with one arm and I would have my other arm reach down in her purse looking for her debit card so I could so I could leave and, and take some money to go get drugs and I think that 
that that shift um, of what I did to my family, even though I was I was still in active addiction, something clicked inside of me where I, I just couldn't do it anymore. My mother is such a big part of my life, and I just I'm, I'm so grateful for that that I had a family, and this doesn't happen for everyone. That always stuck by my side, who who made the tough decisions to get me to where I am today, and had to do some really really um, tough things to get me to where I am today, but they always stuck by me. Uh, no matter what I put them through, they were always there for me. And there were times where they weren't, but just in an effort to get me to where I was to be there for me. So I'm eternally grateful for that. Both of you have had, um, you know, there's some differences, but similar experiences, being a mom of a son with addiction, being a person with addiction, having a mom who, you know, continued to love and support you and a family that continued to love and support you. But you both mentioned something I think is, is really important. There was a point in which you said, okay, something has to change um, for whatever it was, right? Marcy, you were talking about the family program, something clicked, and Patrick, you just said, hey, listen, it, it's time. I'm going to give it a shot. Um, how important do you think that, that moment is um, in a person's journey? whether it's a person who's you know, looking to, to live the life in recovery or someone who's supporting a loved one, how important do you think that moment of change is? Or is it more important about what you do after that moment of change? I think it's more important about what you do after that moment of change because you can get to that moment where you say it needs to change, but if you don't follow through and you don't really make changes yourself, then you're going to be right where you've always been. You're going to be looking for that debit card to go buy drugs, or I'm going to be taking money out of my 401k. And for me, it was like when when my son finally agreed, I got on the phone immediately to my brother and I said, he said he's ready to go, what do I do? And he said, okay, give me five minutes, you'll get a phone call. Meantime, I had got my son to give me his insurance card and I looked up his member services and what facilities he could go to. And it was just, you had to move. When like, and I've told this to people, when an addict says that they're ready, they're ready right then. Mm -hmm. They're not ready tomorrow, they're not ready two days after that. You have to, it's, it's in the moment. It has to be immediate. And so for, anyone who has a loved one be it family friend whomever and they say I'm ready to make a change you have to help them get there as quickly as possible and I think that's probably the best message that I could give to people I mean Marcy it's it's tremendous what you're doing to not only um, change the stigma around addiction but to build compassion within your organization uh, and Patrick, I want to hear from you because I, yeah, I know you've been doing some great work at Independence in, in the same regard, and Marcy's been a great resource. And then I want to come back to the, the choice that you both made to, to choose the workplace because I think that's very unique because there's a lot of organizations and there's a lot of community that would, that would welcome both of you, and you probably have active roles in those organizations as well, but you chose the workplace, which is – somewhat of an impenetrable place from time to time when it comes to these types of, um, you know, scenario, personal scenarios and personal situations. So, Patrick, first I want to just talk a little bit about what you're doing at Independence and, and if you could share a little bit more about your experience. And when I decided to talk about my story and my past and my recovery, um, it was really interesting. So I told a few people here at Independence, and Heather, you were one of them. I remember we had a conversation in your office that I was a person in recovery, and I told my immediate boss, um, Mitch, about it one day. I just, you know, I was sitting at my, my desk, and I just got up, and I walked into his office, and I just talked to him about it. And I had a really powerful experience with our uh, senior vice president, Steve Farah, where him and I were driving up to, actually, my hometown of Scranton for an event and we were driving down the northeast extension of the turnpike. And we were just talking about different things, and, and we just started talking about this. And it was, Steve had, had already known that I was a person in recovery, but it was amazing to me how he let me be the one to tell him. And it was really powerful for me that I was able to, and he just, I remember he was driving, and he just, when I said, Steve, I'm, I'm in recovery, I was uh, addicted to drugs for a long time. 
And he turned over and he looked at me and he had tears welled up in his eyes. He said, I, I know, and I'm, I'm so happy you shared that with me. And we had a great long conversation about everything and he was so, so compassionate. And I was like, wow, this is the type of environment that I work in where I could, one, I'm driving with my senior vice president, which is pretty cool in and of itself. And now we're talking about how I'm a person in recovery and he's, he's literally crying. And so then I was doing a lot of work with the foundation on their, on their conference that, that Marcy was on a panel at. And I was doing a lot of behind the scenes work, helping them with everything. And I remember just finally thinking to myself, you know, why don't I just talk a little bit about my story at this conference and, and see what happens from there. And when I brought out to Steve, he said, you know, I was, I, I was really thinking about this, but I didn't want to ask you if you wanted right. to do it right. because it was a huge room, there were 600 people, uh, pretty, pretty imposing. And we didn't, we didn't tell anyone that I was going to do this. No one knew our entire team. I didn't know. Yeah, Heather didn't know. <laughs> We told um, Jenny, who, who was sort of running the show, we told her about it. And um, so then at the start of the day before the first panel came out, which was with a dear friend of mine, Luke Gorman, then the Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams, and our CEO, Dan Hilferty, I got up and I, I told my story. Uh, just a, a little bit, a cursory overview of, of what it was like for me. And that has opened up so many doors, right? It was, it was getting up there and doing my part to break the stigma to say, hey, you've been working with me for the past two years or whatever it is. Um, I'm, not, I'm not under a bridge with a brown paper bag. I'm sitting next to you, we're doing work together. Um, you know me for who I am and I am a person in recovery. I was actively addicted to drugs and alcohol for a long period of time. And right after I walked backstage and our CEO, Dan Hilferty, gave me a big hug and he said, we need to do something to address this in our workplace. So we started the Someone You Know group here at, at Independence, which helps, you know, be a safe place to, for any individual that's touched by addiction in any way, whether it be the family member, whether it be the person like me in recovery, whether it be the individual that lost a loved one. Uh, both of you are exceptional communicators. Um, but both of you had to, you know, find that in yourselves to to want to come forward and to want to speak, but not just speak, not just talk. There's a lot of action behind what you've both done. So if we could, I just want to, I just want to get your perspective on why you, I mean, chose the workplace. This is not exactly, you know, where you bring your, you know, they always say like when you're at the workplace, leave your problems at the door. But Marcy, you had shared that you really can't do that. You really can't when your child is texting you and in, in dire need of your attention, of your love. And you know, in your case, the money to you know to not feel horribly bad physically, um, you need to respond. You need to be a you need to be a mom. And Patrick, for you, you mentioned that for you, it was like you were doing the same thing to your mom, um, but now here you are in the workplace, and you're like, listen, people need support. People need a safe place. So, so why the workplace, though? I'll say for me, it, it was based on the fears that I had coming back into the workplace and the stigma that I believe is is attached so so strongly in the workplace and I've talked about this on countless occasions and it's for me it's 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 about me but it's more so about my mother and it's about thinking back to when I was putting her through all this stuff and my mother was a secretary for a judge in in the county I grew up in and she had all all this stuff going on I was very the judge uh, you know ran our county's treatment court so she was very in, in the know about stuff like this but had to go to work every day and as marcy talked about earlier wonder where i was and what i was doing and if i was alive and if i was arrested and deal with that every single day and, and afraid to really talk about it and, and why because she didn't want to people to think oh you must be a bad parent you must be what did you do to make your son end up like this mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better term and I just feel like that that is such a false narrative as we know but not enough people know that right. right that it has nothing to do with my mother it has nothing to do with the way I was raised I was had an unbelievable upbringing it had to do with me right and and for me and for the person in recovery 
I'll get back to the fear part, is I was scared. I felt like I was inadequate. I felt like I didn't deserve the opportunities that I was given. I felt that I could not perform the tasks I was given. I felt that that this was all a big facade of me like having this great job and getting into a career and it was all going to crumble. And I didn't know how to deal with that in the workplace. I, I remember when I first started and, uh, and my boss texted me and he said, call me now. And I remember sitting at my desk for about 20 minutes saying, oh my God, I've been here a month, I'm getting fired. There's no way your boss texts you, call me now unless you're getting fired. And I sat there and I was like, you know what? I have to take things into my own hands. I'm gonna have to pack up my stuff and leave because I'm gonna quit before he could ever fire me. And I sat there and this was a big moment in my life from where I had been. I sat there for about 20 minutes, I calmed down. I didn't make a rash decision, I thought it through, which is something I was, you know, for a long time incapable of mm -hmm. doing. Act on instinct and act on emotion and not, not really think a situation through. And I finally, after 20 minutes of shaking and wondering how I was gonna get out of here without anyone seeing me with one of those, you know, cliche boxes after you pack up your desk, I called him. He said, hey, uh, sorry, I need you to make me an Excel spreadsheet of this. And I was like, oh my God, wait, I wasn't getting fired. I was just, had to do a job task. And that really, as mundane and silly as it sounds, was a huge turning point for me in the workplace to say that I could get through some of these situations. And I don't have to go back to the way I always acted and I could continue acting in a manner that helps me and is beneficial to me. And I could give back to other individuals who, who are in the same place that I was in. And I think um, I have a group of friends and a, and a great leader. And you know, there's gonna be a point in the future where we're gonna do a lot more with that, to give individuals in recovery um, that, that sense of purpose back, that sense of drive to say, to help individuals say, you could go back into the workplace. We understand that you have a large gap in your employment history. We understand that you, you don't have maybe the same opportunities that other individuals have because of your wreckage of past. But, but we wanna help you and we wanna help co-create your future and get you to a place where you could get back in the workforce, you could find that sense of purpose again, and you could start thriving again. Because it's it's not just, for me, not just the recovery aspect, but it's, you know, I, I need a purpose. I need, I need to be able to do something every day. I need to get up and believe in what I'm doing every day and go to a, a place to work that I believe in. And I found that here at Independence, and I think it's very important for other individuals when they enter recovery to find that as well. How about you, Marcy? The workplace, I mean, you work for PICO. I'm, I'm sitting with two people who work for two of the most recognizable corporations in the Philadelphia, the greater Philadelphia region and beyond, uh, Independence Blue Cross and PICO. So tell me a little bit about that. So for me, um, the workplace, it wasn't um, a conscious decision. Um, knowing that we had employee resource groups and wanting to do something, for me it was this could be the quickest, best way to touch a number of people, like a large number of people. And so that was my, the reason why I chose the workplace. On a personal level, the reason why I chose the workplace was because I didn't want anybody else to go through what I went through while my son was in active addiction. Since my son has been in recovery, I didn't want to be sitting at a table where somebody said, yeah, I saw that junkie on the corner. Boy, did he look like a piece of trash and, you know, I don't know what's wrong with these people. And you're sitting next to somebody who has a relative who could be that person on the corner mm -hmm. or could have been that person on the corner. And I just, I wanted to do it to make people aware of where you are, who's in the room, 
what you don't know about people and how your words and actions can be so profoundly damaging and hurtful and to just if you can't like you know if you can't say anything nice don't say anything at all it's a golden rule you know something along those lines like i wanted people to be aware that addiction is a disease and if you don't agree with that that's okay but there could be a coworker that you sit next to every single day that is living a life of hell because of either they're in active addiction and they don't want anybody to know they're in recovery they don't want anybody to know or they have a loved one and they don't want anybody to know somebody came into my office and shut the door and said do you have a few minutes and i said sure what's up and they sat across my desk and they said my daughter's an addict and she's out on the street and i don't know what she is where she is and i don't know what she's doing and i'm afraid and what do i do and she just started to cry and i said you really can't do anything and that was the toughest conversation i had to have mm -hmm. you know and you talk about you didn't cause it you can't control it you can't cure it and we prayed together is what we did i gave her some ideas about different support groups i gave her some you know ways of coping mechanisms and things like that and then i said to her whenever you need to talk i'm here so i thought the workplace was the best place to start but from a personal level i really wanted to educate people so that they would think twice before they said things that could be hurtful to the person sitting next to them that they don't know what they're going through you think it's changed do you think you've you think you and the group have had have seen some change in the way that people communicate and the way that people treat each other and um, just the general culture of the workplace when it comes to addiction i do um i've there's been a lot of people who have said, I want to join. Mm -hmm. There was an event that we had last year and it was a whole new group of faces. So it was people that were afraid to come before, but then they decided to come. And afterwards they were saying, I want to join the group. I want to be a part of this. And, you know, they asked me to do the closing and um, cause each of us usually on the team usually take, you know, a part of, whatever it is, you know, the different tasks of the event. And sometimes it's behind the scenes, sometimes it's in front. And in that closing, I said, I said, I'm here to tell you today that I am the mom of a recovering heroin addict. And I am as proud to say that as somebody who says, my son is a doctor, my daughter is a lawyer. And when they say those things and I say to them, well, I'm the mom of a recovering heroin addict. And my son works at that every single day. What your children did is admirable, and they went to school, and now they're living their life. But what my son does, he does every single day. And I am so proud of him. And people came up after I said that to say, I've never heard anybody say they were proud of it's such a, such a positive message, Marcy. Yeah, it was, they said, I've never heard anybody say that. I said, but think about what they do. I mean, think about what they do. They get hard work every day, every day, every single day. And I'm proud of you, Patrick. You know, I, the day that we were at you, that conference and you said to me, I'm going to tell my story. And I got chills because I knew what that was like for my son to sit and tell his story in front of 250 people at Pico that he didn't know, you know, and he told his story and I'm thinking to myself, you're standing up in front of your coworkers and telling your story. And that was an amazing thing to witness. Thank you. So that's why the workplace is a good place to start. Well, you both are the change makers to help make this happen and, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm deeply appreciative to be able to work for a company that has a culture that you know embraces diversity and inclusion on all levels and all forms and that includes the someone you know group and Patrick without your leadership and Dan Hilferty's leadership I don't know that we would be there right I don't know that that would be a priority and at the forefront so we owe you uh, a great deal of appreciation and gratitude for for taking this on and and doing it in such a way that is um, so welcoming and so inclusive and Marcy you know. 
I'm sure Patrick has already said, but uh, I'd like to thank you personally for the work that you're doing at PICO for, you know, for being so courageous as a mom and as a person who's lived with uh, addiction in your family for so many years, but to, to be able to be a little more free and, and vocal and, and supported in your, um, in your journey going forward and for helping us. But then just the work that you do every day, you know, somewhat quietly, guys, you're not, you know, you're not uh, public figures, right? You're, you're in your workplaces, doing your job, doing what you feel is what needs to be done. And that's commendable. So I want to thank you both for not only sharing your stories, but for the continued great work uh, and leadership that you demonstrate and for being those change agents uh, in our community. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. If you or someone you know is suffering from opioid addiction, please visit ibxfoundation.org slash SYK. The link is in our show notes below.